I think what we've all been made aware of throughout today is that our children come to school very involved. And life is very complicated for a number of our children. And so we have to look at, like Dr. Howard said, this multi-layered approach to ensure that we're able to the extent possible be able to prevent and intervene and be with behaviors that really present a threat to not only the student at hand, but to the larger school community. And so before I go over the case review, it's important for you to recognize or perhaps to take back to your district whether or not your district has policies and procedures in place to assess the need of recruiting and securing the support of the START team. So ensuring that there's policies, ensuring that there's practices, ensuring that there's procedures so that we are careful on our analysis and outcomes and that we don't become complacent. And so what we want to make sure that you understand this afternoon is that START services are available to every school district in Los Angeles County. And I often refer to them as that kind of priceless team. You couldn't even put a dollar amount on what they were able to offer to the school community. But in recruiting them, we had to make sure that our district had an evaluation process in place. And what we were really looking at and being able to determine is to differentiate between those who make a threat and those whose presence presents a threat. And that's critically important because as we've learned through all of our different processes today, kids will say things impulsively, but there's no action to substantiate what they've communicated. So what we're looking at and working with the START team and recruiting their assistance are those individuals whose presence on your campus or within your school community present a threat. Because what we do know is that not all threats are the same. Um, they're not equal, and so we have to really go through and be able to differentiate with that. And what START is, I look at it as not only an intervention, but also a prevention. Because the more staff that we train, the more effective we are to be able to respond to the needs of our students. Because it reduces risk factors, it identifies where educational support is needed, and it reduces, quite honestly, the legal liability. Because in the capacity of local parentis, we know we are responsible for every child coming to school safely, being on campus safely, and returning home safely. And so when we look at the data, this is what the statistics tell us, that 93% of cases where there was an action upon that threat, somebody knew something. And so we have to create a community and a culture where individuals talk and kids report to adults. We know that 81% of the incidents, someone heard it from somebody else, but still didn't say something. We know that 89% of the cases, more than one person knew of the proposed event. And we also know that 93 of the cases, a schoolmate or a sibling knew something was gonna happen. So when we look at the prevention piece of school threat and threats made by threat makers, we do have an opportunity to prevent but we also want to make sure that as we go forward and we look at our school community, that we're able to really differentiate between suicide assessments and threat assessments because those behaviors look very different. So with suicidal behavior, we're looking at signs of depression. We're looking at history of mental health. We're looking at withdrawal of interaction with their peers and others, that social interaction that's so important. We're looking at behaviors like self-injurious behavior and we're working with young people that talk about suicide and having the desire to die. With our threat makers, the assessment outcomes look a little bit different. What we know is that 93% of those threat makers engaged in a behavior that caused concern to others, but again, may not have been reported. So that anti-typical behavior. We know that at least 88% of those adults that work with children had a concern about that child but just didn't say anything, not yet, I don't want to overreact, I don't want to assume. But what we do know is that there's no profile. So we know that there is a large percentage, probably half of those incidences that occurred where that individual didn't demonstrate unusual behavior. And so we are often cautioning ourselves that we cannot profile any one individual. So as we move forward, what I want to share with you is a case that we began to work very closely together about eight years ago. 
and the student was a transfer into our district. So um, automatically, when a student transfers into a high school district in the 12th grade, don't your antennas go up? Where you think 12th grade, that's a hard transition age. And that student transferred into our district with no preceding documents, no reports, no information given to our district. And the student resided with their legal guardian, which were his grandparents. Very well-meaning, very supportive of his academic success, but in a, uh, had a high tendency of denial and the severity and significance of what their grandchild was becoming involved in. How the student came in our radar, and it was about a seven to nine month process his senior year, is that at Halloween in October, he wore army fatigue, but on his army fatigue, he had a belt that we discovered later had live ammunition on it. The guardians and grandparents um, were in extreme denial. They said that, um, that those artifacts were of historical value, that they weren't live ammunition, that they were antiques and that there was no reason he couldn't bring that to school. So as a district, START was not involved yet, but the student and family and administrator came up to my office and we created a behavioral plan because you're looking at every other means of corrective action before you impose a consequence, particularly because we knew there was significant mental health needs. When asked upon his private prior school, everything was beautiful, he did great in his prior school, no other behavioral problems, how the grandparents reported this to us was this was brand new behavior. And again, we overreacted on the circumstances. One of the conditions of his behavioral contract was that he would participate in counseling. And really that was our priority, to find a way to leverage counseling because they did not, even though it was offered prior, they did not accept that willingly. And so we sat down and we helped the parents understand the significance and the importance of counseling, particularly as he transitioned out of high school into his adult school years. And during the counseling session, several months after he had been in counseling, and the parents, grandparents opted for the counseling to take place off of the school campus because of the perceived stigma associated with counseling. So he went up to the agency that was north of our school community. And during his counseling session, he disclosed to his therapist about three months into therapy um, that he had this fascination of school shootings. And in fact, he was naming our school district as one of those areas that if that were to occur, this is how I would do it. And it began to be very prescribed in this therapy session, even down to the type of clothing he would wear during the course of this event. So as done in therapy, a little different than school-based, it was disclosed to this student that um, the therapist was going to need to recruit additional assistance and support to evaluate the level of risk. And when the therapist stepped away for a moment, what do you suspect the student did? He AWOL, he ran. And so now we have a critically missing student and our district was notified and so we gathered our local police department and proceeded to the neighboring community where the therapy was being offered and we had their local police department, our local police department and what adds to the complexity is we have two city police departments that service our district, 13 elementary schools and four high schools. And so there was a multi-city search for this young man. Now the grandparents proceeded up to the agency as well and they assured us that there was no way their grandson would know how to get onto a bus, yet alone find his way five miles back to the city. And we tried to help them understand that this was an easy task for any child to do. And so as the bulletin went out across the city, he was later discovered about an hour later. Meanwhile, we put all the schools in lockdown even though it was 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We all know that there's a lot of after school events, so sporting events and club events and tutoring. And so we shut down all athletic events, put all schools in lockdown, all 13 elementaries, all four high schools, because he didn't name a specific school. And we didn't know what he had access to. And he was discovered in a neighboring park about an hour later and had already changed his clothing. And he had met up with some peers from the school and so not only was he apprehended, but were, so were the other two peers. They were later released. They had no idea what he was up to, um, but because they were associates, they were interviewed before they were released. In the meantime, the police department stepped in and he was quickly transported to a county facility and placed on a hold. 
And then that's where we contacted um, school threat assessment team, assistance and support, and began the process of what's next. Because it's one thing to say that certainly we can impose disciplinary action, but that's not going to treat what we need to treat. And so we came together with the school threat assessment team, with our two agencies, with um, all of the associated administrators, as well as a local agency where this threat was made, and came up with a plan. And one of the plans that we needed to ensure our school community is that their students were safe because you can only imagine how quickly this information spread. So the following day, we proceeded with a, um, a stay away order for every school in the district um, so that we could make sure we served the student before he was released from lockdown. We know that that stay away order is nothing more than a piece of paper, but it's a demonstration to students, to staff, and to families that we're doing everything in our power to protect all environments involved. And then we came together once he was released and began to facilitate the services that needed to be done. I think what was so amazing is that when Stark came on board, we coordinated not only Stark team, but we coordinated police departments, three jurisdictions, grandparents, the student, and Stark had already developed a relationship because they went to the hospital where he was placed on a hold, so they began to play kind of an adversarial role and more importantly, recruit the trust of the grandparents. There are a lot of other pieces that went into place, such as schooling proceeded at the police department so that we could ensure the safety and welfare of everybody else involved. But we are fortunate because he did graduate. He graduated on time. He received services. His grandparents were actively involved in a number of parenting courses that we offered throughout the course of the year, although they reminded me every day that they attended that they didn't need these services, but they felt that they were somewhat beneficial. Um, and we still stay in contact with the grandparents, and I know Start will call very regularly as far as how he is doing and where he's at. And so I'm going to turn it over so that you can see really their invaluable service and how it really supported the efforts of not only a student receiving the services they need, but a district ensuring the safety that we needed to demonstrate. Good afternoon. So um, I'm going to start with, uh, you know, that I'm going to continue and I'm going to tell you where the case is now because even after eight years, we continue to monitor that case and now he's fully employed and I will uh, tell you how he's doing. But one of the things is that um, STAR has been around for 10 years now. Uh, and now, just recently, the Board of Supervisors uh, uh, ruled a motion to expand the program. So uh, it's, always, it's always been 10 uh, clinicians under my supervision, now we have 44. So three more uh, supervisors and then 44 clinicians. So now every service area in LA County has a STAR team. Um, and the, again, the program is countywide. Uh, and it is a specialized unit in threat assessment and risk management. The other thing is all of our clinicians, including myself, have the LPS designation, which means uh, we can assess the student and if we determine that the student needs to pl uh, be placed on a 5150 or, or 72 hour psychiatric hold, we have the designation and we have the uh, ability to do so. Um, so I'm gonna start with what is START, uh, for those of you who may not know. But START provides training and consultation, and training to professionals like you, uh, but we also provide training to teachers, parents, and students. I think it is important that they know because they're gonna be your eyes and ears in, on, in your campus. We have many referrals that we get from students who have heard um, a student make a comment, like Dr. Bear said, 70% of students uh, we know, based on uh, the FBI analysis on 36 school shootings, that 70% of them have communicated their intent to someone, either by text, social media, or, or verbally. And so it is important. And, and the training that we do for students, we leave them with, with this in mind. If you hear, uh, if you see something, hear something, say something, and it has worked, like I said. Um, we also do training in terms of bullying because, again, the FBI in 2002 and, and, and in 2017, they, their analysis of those 36 actual shootings, they identify one factor in common among them, and it was that whether they, that, that they were either, I'm sorry, either a victim of bullying or they were the bullies themselves. So that's why we provide that training as well, and it's for teachers and, parent, um, and, and students. Um, the other one is that we want to 
identify students of concern early enough. So START is a um, prevention early intervention. We do not want to get uh, to the place in which we now need tactical uh, and police enforcement because now you have an active shooter in your, on your campus. We want to be able to identify them early enough so that we can provide uh, the services that they need uh, in time. And our assessment is very lengthy. Sometimes when we get a case, we see ourselves working on a case for two, three weeks or four weeks max because we have to identify, we have to get a, a 360 degree view of who the student is. So it's collateral information. It's uh, checking on their social media, uh, going to the home, family, uh, identifying the family dynamics. Just this past week, we got a referral for eight students who were plotting uh, school shootings in different schools uh, simultaneously. And one of the students said, this is something the nation has never seen, and he's correct. You probably have heard that school shooters are imitators and not innovators. And in this case, the plan of these eight students, it's an innovative idea. Uh, and so we got that refer those referrals on Thursday. We saw ourselves working and going into the juvenile hall, start the threat assessment, go to the home visits, um, contacting the school district, providing consultation, and throughout the weekend, we had to move very rapidly. So, if, you know, that's another thing about STAR that it is, we respond in real time because you cannot let this crisis stay at your desk for days and weeks. We have to uh, act immediately. So the assessments are very lengthy. And the intervention varies. Sometimes, yes, it is a psychiatric hospital, uh, you know, placing the student in a psychiatric hold. Another one is incarceration. Uh, another perhaps uh, going into a uh, residential treatment. But no matter where the student goes, STAR will continue to follow. STAR is the only program in uh, LA County DMH that is able to go into the juvenile hall, so the jail, or the psychiatric hospitals and in, in, initiate the threat assessment um, promptly. Because you know most of our crisis emergencies come when? On Friday evening, right? So we don't wait until Monday because we use the weekend. We go immediately because Monday comes, the school district is, or your schools are waiting for our consultation. And so we, again, we need to start developing a safety net, uh, keeping the community safe, the school safe, and then also what services are we gonna put in place for the student. And risk management. So STAR does not only provide services to the student, but also to the parents or family members. We have to identify what, it, again, what are the di family dynamics and I identify those services so that we can put them in place. So it's not only for the student, it's anyone who um, lives close with the, with the student and perhaps, uh, again, they're facing challenges. So, so it, it, it varies. But risk management and ongoing monitoring and long-term monitoring. I started with a program 10 years ago and in some cases we still monitor since then uh, because these cases are very dynamic. This is our STAR model. Uh, we assess immediate uh, danger, then we do our clinical assessment and collateral interviews. Uh, we want to, to be able to uh, find fact-finding uh, and objective data. Uh, you know, after the Parkland shooting, I can tell you we got about 150 referrals within a week and a half. And a lot of, a lot of it was fear uh, because you are familiar with what happened with the Parkland shooting. And so a lot of, uh, you know, agencies were afraid uh, that perhaps uh, they were gonna drop the ball in one student that perhaps they had a concern about. And so we got a lot of referrals in which, uh, again, it was just uh, because the student was wearing a trench coat or, uh, you know, what have you. So it, we really have to uh, be able to um, base our assessment and, and identify the level of risk based on fact, fi uh, uh, fact finding and objective data. Uh, and then is to develop uh, the, a, and reinforce a safety net. And sometimes we find ourselves not starting from the um, right to left, but sometimes we, end ourself, uh, we find ourselves uh, working from um, the uh, left to the right. And that is because a lot of the times, most of our cases come uh, when uh, the student is in a psychiatric hospital or incarcerated. And so these are the intervention goals, to stop forward motion. We do know that students or individuals who are planning a school shooting or a terrorist attack, when they know that someone is monitoring them, they tend to change their plans. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, Elio Roger, the shooter from Isla Vista. Do you remember the police went and knocked on his door and he wrote in his manifesto, you know, I thought the police was gonna ask me to let them in 
uh, and go to my, my room, they would have found all the weaponry, all my plans, my computer, I would have to have changed my plans. And the other thing is that he, a year before, um, he was already planning the shooting, and he identified February the 14th to be his, uh, the target date. But he canvassed the, uh, the streets of Isla Vista, and he identified that there was a lot of police, and he, so he thought, this is not a good time or a good day for me to do the shooting. Uh, and so he changed his plans. So again, we do know that when they are aware that someone is monitoring them, they do change their plans, and they, and they stop their plans, plans as well. And so we want to be able to uh, surface the threat and, and the dynamics. So dynamics is it's important to go to the student's house, find out who they live with, what is happening or what has happened in the student's life that is causing them to think about violence as a remedy to their problem. So it's important. Our threat assessment is not completed until we have gone to the student's home. The other thing is we want to know what are they doing in their bedroom or in their basement or in their garage. You know that most of the plans, most of those shootings, those 36 shootings or the shootings in the nation, that students were, were keeping their weapons, their plans, their computers, everything in the room, and parents were not aware of it. And so we want to know uh, what, what is it that the students are doing um, at home. And we want to be able to mitigate or eliminate a threat. And I said mitigate because as with this case that Dr. Baer presented, uh, a lot of the times you're not going to completely eliminate the threat because uh, these cases are very dynamic. They may be stable. Once you put services in place, they have mental health services and then any other community services, they become stable. But then over time, what happens if they stop treatment? What happens if they stop taking their medication? What happens if there's another uh, uh, tragedy or another trauma uh, in their life? Then they go back again to think about homicidality. That's why it's important for us to stay on the case long term and continue to monitor. And again, the goal is to establish a comprehensive safety net around the student. And, uh, and we do this in, in planning with the schools. If the school, you know, we provide again consultation after a threat assessment, and we help the schools develop a safety plan, what they call a reentry plan. And what's gonna happen? If the school is going to allow the student to remain in school, well, what services are we gonna put in place in, during school time and also at home? Now, if you're gonna expel the student, then what happens? Who's gonna be watching the student now at home? By expelling someone, perhaps you created now a, 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 a bigger grievance or a, a, now you become a target. So the, again, who's gonna be watching the student and working with the student uh, to ensure? Expelling or suspending someone doesn't mean they cannot come back and, and, and do a, you know, unfortunately, a school shooting. So again, that's when START um, uh, becomes involved and, and this is why it's important to uh, keep an eye on the student. So the purpose of uh, STAR is to prevent targeted school violence. And, and STAR is K through 12 and higher education, so it's not only K through 12. And it is to assist the student, not to criminalize the student, but it's to assist. The main goal of STAR is for students to be successful, to move forward, and hopefully with no further incidents. And to develop partnerships. So our partnerships is um, the school districts, uh, law enforcement, local and federal uh, lo law enforcement, and through our partnership with the Sheriff's Department, uh, we have access to uh, an intelligence analyst who is the person who assists us in looking into what, are, what is the student doing in social media. Are they uh, you know, communicating with the incels? That's the problem that we have right now. These incels that I don't know if you are familiar, but it has become a problem because that is a platform that a lot of the students are using now to pose their threats and also recruit others uh, in their plans of either uh, doing a school shooting or a terrorist attack. So it is important uh, that analysts plays a significant role in, our, in, in uh, developing a uh, comprehensive safety net and to understand the student as well. So these are the critical factors and this is what we look into. Communications, what, is, what did the student say? Behaviors, what is the student doing? And does the behavior correlates with the communication? In other words, so if a student makes a threat, um, and now you look into the threat assessment, you do the threat assessment, and you identify not, that not only the student made a threat, but they're also trying to acquire weapons, that they're looking into the school map, that they're looking into schedules, that they're breaching 
uh, you know, what, they, what we call the threat assessment, that they're, they're, they're breaching now to the pathway of violence, which means are they bringing a duffel bag to school to see if they go unnoticed? Do they bring any weapons to school, for example, a knife? Are they testing the limits? So those are the behaviors that we want to look into. And then the dynamics. What is happening, again, in the, in the student's life that is causing them to think about violence uh, to solve the problems? And weaponry. So out of the four, behaviors is the most indicative that someone is in the pathway to violence. And so as we're going to see with our case, uh, Dr. Bear already introduced uh, that he was, a seven, he was 17 at the time, and he did have fantasies of shooting up his school. Um, he was uh, acquiring gear, and I'm going to show you what we found in his closet. Uh, and also, uh, that was the first time that he had a psychotic episode, that that was an onset of a mental illness. Uh, we also identified that there was family history of mental illness, uh, and he had never been untreated. Also, there was trauma in the home. Um, parents were not involved. He uh, suffered from abandonment. Both parents were using substances on top of having a mental illness. And so what we did is, uh, again, Dr. Bear already mentioned, we did see him at the psychiatric hospital. He remained in a psychiatric hospital for one month. Uh, one of the, the good things about STAR is that we are able to communicate with psychiatrists because as you know, when you place someone on a psychiatric hold, sometimes they are released the same day, right? And so STAR advocates uh, with the psychiatrist and coordinates with the psychiatrist so they can keep them longer, especially if this is the first episode of mental illness. And so that's what we did. He stayed there for a month. We were able to work um, with the grandparents and also him because he was 17. He had the right to uh, decline or um, uh, agree to mental, mental uh, psychiatric medication. Even if the grandparents said no, he was 17. He, he could say, he could um, agree to them without the parental consent. But in this case, uh, we were able to convince both and he was administered medication and so they kept him for a month to see what uh, his reaction would be. We also partic participated in the discharge planning. So what's gonna happen next? Uh, so one of the things that STAR does is that if we, if we have to go and pick up the student to take him to his next psychiatric appointment, to make the psychi psychiatric appointment, to go get his medication, we will do so. Uh, and so that's what we did in this case as well. Um, so, you know, we, um, he was uh, arranged for him to take his final exams at a police station because, you know, again, we had to keep the school safe. Uh, so he was able to um, complete high school, he continued with his uh, psych psychotherapy, and it's not just referring them to mental health treatment, but identifying if most of our cases, I would tell you that probably 95% of them are already linked to mental health services, but they do not have the intensive mental health services that they need. And in this case, he needed intensive mental health services. Uh, so that's what we put in place, and of course, uh, his psychotropic medication. He completed high school and he moved on to a community college. And this is the thing with START. Again, I, I mentioned to you that it is K through 12 and higher education. So just because a student graduates from high school, we're not um, relieved from uh, our liability. We have to communicate with, if they're gonna go to a community college or a four year university, we will communicate with the threat assessment team there. And again, we don't want to hinder their future, but we wanna be able to that they continue to be monitored that they continue to get help. And in this case, the SPS, I don't know if all of you know, but every community college and every university, they have what they call the student disabled services. And so we are able to communicate with them, enrolling them in their services. They can continue their IEP there. And so they'll provide support. Uh, and again, they'll, be, uh, they'll continue to uh, monitor the student. And if anything goes wrong, they will let us know uh, right away. And so that's what we do. Even if students move out of state, a start is not relieved of their responsibility either. So we still have to communicate with the state that they're going to, if they're gonna to go to a university. And again, also that we can continue to help the student, not hinder the student, but continue to help them. So he was able to, um, again, uh, uh, graduate from uh, a community college. He's fully employed now. And you know, the, the reason why we stayed on this case is because this particular young man does not have a lot of protective factors. His parents, uh, grandparents uh, were already elderly parent, grandparents. Mother and father in, are not in, in, in his life. 
and his sister is also mentally ill. So very, very few protective factors. So what we did also is we uh, found, identified uh, a mentor, a male mentor, because this young man, that's what he lacked. He had no male mentorship in his life. And so um, I can tell you again that he's fully employed. We continue to check in with him. He's still living with our grandparents, uh, but he's doing well. And we will continue. We want to make sure that he stays in mental health treatment. And again, successful. That is the main goal of START. So this is what we found in his um, closet. Uh, and again, when he spoke to his psychiatrist, he specifically identified and described what he would wear the day of the school shooting. Uh, he was determined to do so. And that's what we found in his closet as well. So again, hence the importance of us going into the home. And I can tell you again, you know, uh, the reason why we thought about developing a STAR team, because LAPD SMART was the first um, uh, agency who, who thought about developing the st uh, a STAR team uh, right after the Virginia Tech shootings. And, but the, the, they're law enforcement. And STAR is a civilian team. And so, you know, when we go to the homes, families are more receptive and more willing to work with us when they see a civilian versus someone in a uniform. Uh, although, again, we work very cl closely with law enforcement, but um, I, um, in the initial phase, we do uh, utilize our, our uh, civilian team. So uh, this is the end, and uh, if you have any questions, and this is my email address. If you email me uh, for questions, I can send you the referral form. We have now our own website in which you can go in and complete a referral form. And don't hesitate to call for consultation. Threat assessment and risk management, you cannot do that in, sil in silos. You need consultation uh, and, and support uh, to be able to manage these cases. So this is my email address. Uh, if you send me an email, like, again, I will send you the forms that you need uh, with any, and respond to any questions that you might have. So one of the reasons that we wanted to make sure we shared this resource with you is that as you're evolving your community schools, it's important that you bring in perhaps those partners that are not as consistently recruited, such as our DMH specialized teams, but also working closely and developing those relationships with your local police department, local sheriff department, mm -hmm. and local resources. Of, so together you can come together as a team that's effective with the strong outcomes that we've experienced over the years in using START. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.